Good day and uh, greetings. Uh, it's good to be here with you again, uh, consistently it seems, uh, lately. And uh, I'm looking forward to today's message that we have in Psalm 119. Uh, hopefully you've been able to follow along uh, in Psalm 119 as we've been trying to work our way through uh, this uh, longest psalm in the book of Psalms. We just resumed our study uh, of this psalm last Sunday, and uh, today we're moving on to the next uh, set of verses. So thank you for being here, and uh, just uh, just want to ask God to bless you uh, as you hear from his word today. So let me ask you some questions. How would you define a need? And what is the difference between a need and a want? Is a need similar to a want, or is a need more like a desire? Or is a want more like a desire? And what are our needs? As you consider those questions, uh, let me rem- introduce you to Elizabeth Elliot, if you've never heard of her. She was a Christian author and speaker. Her first husband, Jim Elliot, was a missionary who was killed when attempting to make contact with the Yucca people of eastern Ecuador. And interesting uh, to note that she would... Uh, Elizabeth would end up spending uh, two years living with the very same people who killed her husband. And then she would go on to write a number of books, about 20 or more, and then tour around sharing her knowledge and experience. And Elizabeth once said about needs, quote, God has promised to supply all our needs. What we don't have now, we don't need now, end quote. Well, we still haven't gotten any closer to answering those initial questions that I proposed, have we? So how do we define what a need is, what a want is? You see, one of the challenges that we have here in understanding what a need or a want is, is that we could come up with very, very many and plenty of subjective answers to these questions. You might describe, for example, a need in your life that that might be more like a want to someone else. And to someone else, their wants ends up being described as a need by someone else. For example, some people couldn't go apparently one day without a cup of coffee. I like my coffee, but I don't know if I would uh, worry about it if I didn't have it today. But anyways, back to what I was saying, people couldn't go one day without a cup of coffee. These coffee addicts may say something like, I need my cup of joe in the morning or the rest of my day is a disaster. Is a cup of coffee really a need? Will your day become a disaster if you don't have it? What would happen if for for whatever weird reason coffee wasn't available from this moment on? Well, nothing would happen. You just fire up the kettle and grab yourself a cup of tea if you want. So you can see how we could go around and around in circles trying to sort this out subjectively. Now, in case you've forgotten, the better question was already asked concerning our needs. And the question is, what are our needs? Now we are, uh, have something to grab a hold, in, hold of, something we can put our hands around, something that we can rationally and logically apprehend and attempt to answer. So uh, as we try to do this, let's uh, begin by reading the text for the day. We turn in your Bibles to Psalm 119, starting at verse 73. Psalm 119, verse 73. Your hands have made and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Those who fear you shall see me and rejoice, because I have hoped in your word. I know, O Lord, that your rules are righteous, and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Let your steadfast love comfort me according to your promise to your servant. Let your mercy come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. Let the insolent be put to shame because they have wronged me with falsehood. As for me, I will meditate on your precepts. Let those who fear you turn to me and that they may know your testimonies. And may my heart be blameless in your statutes that I may not be put to shame. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray together. Oh Lord, thank you for this moment here. As we look at this uh, psalm, as we look at this uh, set of texts, these verses here, O Holy Spirit, enlighten uh, our minds and illuminate our minds. Teach us, deepen our hearts, the truths of God. 
And then would we transport those into our hands and feet as we serve each other and our neighbors as well. We pray all this for the glory of God and for your Son, Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we discovered that the psalmist, in the midst of his trials and tribulations, had placed his full trust and faith in the goodness of God. And despite his circumstances, he had remained faithful and entrusted his situation to God. He committed to being obedient to the commandments of God, as we saw last week, as found in the Word of God itself. And from this, we had a short but important discussion regarding the goodness of God. Now, if you haven't seen that, or um, was there, you haven't been, pardon me, if you weren't there with us last week, you can see that video on uh, Redwater Alliance a YouTube page. So we had this discussion regarding the goodness of God. And we came away, I hope, with the assurance that God is good. Because the goodness of God is, in essence, the very nature of God. While we, as his creation, can share in this moral attribute, rather imperfectly, God, whose very nature is good, and the essence of who God is, he is always good, all the time. And this biblical truth of the nature and character of God was essential to the psalmist in his comprehending of why God allowed trials and tribulations into his life. And why God himself would even discipline him directly in his life, or why God would discipline him through the persecutions and trials and suffering from those around him. With this in mind, we see here in our text for today that the psalmist proclaimed God as creator. Let's, ver let's read verse 73, that first phrase there, your hands have made and fashioned me. And we want to press pause here and try and unpack that statement. What did the psalmist have in mind here? Remember, uh, the psalmist would have had a good knowledge and working knowledge and understanding of the Torah. In other words, the, the first five books of the Bibles that we have today. You know, that's Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and and Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So it would be no stretch to say that the psalmist had his mind in to the very beginning of human history. He had his mind in the book of Genesis, which reveals to us the pinnacle, that at the pinnacle of creation, God the Creator, as Genesis would say, created man in his, image, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 1, verse 27. We go to another fellow in the Old Testament, his name is Job. We hopefully understand some of the issues that he was dealing in that book. And Job, in his plea to God for resolution to his suffering, said this, Your hands fashioned and made me, just like the psalmist said here. But because of the context that Job was in, he would go on to say also, Your hands fashioned and made me, and now you have destroyed me altogether. Job 10 and 8. But he did recognize God as his creator. King David, in one of his psalms, giving praise to the all-knowing, ever-present God in his own life, said this, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. That's from Psalm 139, verse 13 and 14. So what we have here, folks, is the work of God in creation or the works of God's hand in creation, if you will. The Lexham Survey of Theology defines the doctrine of creation in this way. Quote, There is a creator God who has made the universe for his own purposes. And furthermore, quote, God created the universe and all that is in it for our enjoyment and stewardship, and to bear witness to his glory, end quote. So what the psalmist was doing here in our text was keeping with the theme of his psalm. That the word of God is a reflection of the character and nature of God himself. So in this case, verse 73 is pointing to a distinctive characteristic of God as creator. Now someone else said it this way, quote, God is the cause of the universe. God is the real and exclusive agent of creation, end quote. So it was important, you see, for the psalmist to come to this conclusion. What conclusion? That God had created him for a purpose. For a purpose. And we can say with assurance that he was created to give God, his creator, all the glory, as we are also. 
And that is because God created him. And because God created him, pardon me, it came with this responsibility on part of the psalmist. It came with obligations, if you will, to God, because God had, what, made and fashioned him, according to King David, had formed his inward parts. He was fearfully and wonderfully made by the Creator. He was created in the image and likeness, as Genesis tells us. And we see here in verse 73, then the psalmist turning to God and praying that God would give him understanding that he would learn his commandments. Verse 73. The psalmist humbly understood that as a created being, he needed God, his Creator. He learned and understood what God had revealed about himself in the word of God, the self-revelation of God that we find in his word. What God had revealed about mankind and their condition, about what God has revealed in the Bible, in the word of God, about his redemptive plan and purpose in human history. And the psalmist humbly received the word of God from his good, wise, and holy, and just creator. And not only did he humbly receive the word of God, the psalmist also became a witness to God's goodness in creation. We see this in verse 74. Those who fear you shall see me and rejoice because I have hoped in your word. The psalmist witnessed to the faithfulness of God. Verse 75. I know, O Lord, that your rules, that is his just decrees, are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. The psalmist witnessed to the promise-keeping, unfailing, unfailing covenantal love and kindness of God in his life. Verse 76, let your steadfast love comfort me according to your promise for your servants. So we began with a question to consider. What is the need? Now, if we could ask the psalmist the same question, how do you suppose he would answer if he could? May I suggest to you that he would say, I need God. The psalmist would say, the psalmist would say of all the things that I might think I need, of all the things that I would consider a need, I know with certainty, I know beyond a shadow of doubt that above all else I need God. And surely the words of the text that we have here cry out clearly, I need God. Well, I want to introduce you to one a person called Abigail Dots. Now, Abigail is a wife, a mother of five children, who had her fair share of trials in life. We all have our fair share of trials, don't we? But Abigail tells a story at the time when her, of the time when her 13-month-old son was lying in the ER room. And, and she describes it this way, that he was looking still, pale, and lifeless, pretty serious. And Abigail, according to her own story, said, at this time of her life, had come to understand that God didn't owe her children. And that sometimes God does take children away after he has given them. For Abigail had also gone through a miscarriage. Was she frightened at this moment with her son in the ER? Of course she was. And in her own words, she describes it this way, quote, my naive 20-something self was shocked by this reality. And as she considered the story of Job, as we mentioned earlier, she also considered the story of Job. His suffering comforted Abigail and yet at the same time frightened her, for he rem she remembered what Job said. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Job chapter 1, verse 21. We fast forward. Her son survived this medical emergency, but according to her story, remains to this day with serious medical problems. And it was in this experience that she describes that God began to, in her own words, rework her understanding of what she needed in life and what made her thrive in her life. And she began asking questions like, do I need my son to be healthy? How healthy was healthy enough? Do I need sleep? How much? And Abigail also considered what questions others might have. Do you need to move to a different city? Do you need a different house? Do you need God to answer uh, your prayer, uh, give you a yes to the prayer that you've been praying for for many, many years? 
Well, Abigail's story continued. Uh, as we already mentioned, she survived her youngest child's medical emergency and her son began improving ever so slowly. Abigail and her family was able, according to herself, to her own words, by prayer and trust in God's promises to endure this trial and continue on. But God, according to Abigail, continued to rework her understanding of what she needed, what uh, need, neediness means in her life, and what thriving meant in her life. And then she, she starts to share the story of what she calls the little trials that she encountered that followed the big ones. And this is the ones that she warns you and me more about. One of the issues was lack of sleep because her son would often wake in the night. So into her mind came this idea that in order for God to be able to use her, she needed God to what? Let her sleep. She wanted to trust God with her eyes closed. But gradually Abigail began to learn that God wouldn't let her settle her heart on lesser needs. Abigail came to understand that she had bigger needs than her health or the health of her kids. Let's go back to our text. The psalmist witnessed, the psalmist witness continues here in verse 77 as he prayed to a merciful God. The psalmist said, let your mercy come to me that I may live for your law is my delight. The psalmist appealing to the compassionate God. We also have the witness of King David who like our psalmist appealed to the mercy and compassion of God when David said, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and that God, like a father, shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. You find that in Psalm 103, verse 8 and verse 13. So notice with me, as we look, we draw back a bit and look at this, uh, uh, this, these verses uh, with a bigger, bigger lens. The psalmist here had in mind two groups of people. We go back to the very first psalm of the book of Psalms and we see the psalmist there clearly describing two groups of people. Verse 6 of Psalm number 1 tells us about one group, for the Lord knows the ways of, right, of the righteous. And then it tells us about the second group, but the way of the wicked will perish. And back here in Psalm, verse, Psalm 119, verse 78, the psalmist describes the wicked. He said, let the insolent be put to shame because they have wronged me with falsehood. Notice the word insolent. We talked about it last week, this word insolent. The Hebrew can also be translated arrogant or proud. The New International Version uses the word arrogant. The New King James Version uses the word proud. So pride and arrogance describe what the word of God calls the wicked. And pride is made manifest in the wicked by their falsehood. In this context, the wicked have wronged or subverted the psalmist. The wicked in their pride and arrogance had lied about the motivation of the psalmist. And when we consider the prayer of the psalmist to have the proud put to shame, it is a righteous prayer by the psalmist, asking that God, as another psalmist put it, fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name, O Lord. That was from Psalm 83, 16. You see, the greatest need of the wicked in his day, the greatest uh, need of the wicked in our day is the gracious mercy of God. The greatest need of the wicked is a biblical fear of God. Well, the point is made. The contrast is evident in the text. The contrast is clear between the proud and those who fear God. You know, some of the world's well-known citizens have revealed their unwillingness to fear God. Actor and film producer Woody Allen once said, quote, To you I am an atheist, to God I am the loyal opposition. Astronomer Kale Sagan once said, I don't want to believe, I want to know. And an unknown source said, I don't believe God, I am the God. Well, so how do we respond to this? Well, I just want to just share what C.S. Lewis might have said to these atheists, these uh, these folks who do not fear God. C.S. Lewis once said, quote, 
atheists express their rage against God, although in their view he doesn't exist. So they hate someone that does, they don't even believe exists. You see, our psalmist was not discouraged, even amongst those who did not fear God. He prayed for those who, like him, feared God. He prayed for their companionship. Together they would know God's word. Verse 79, let those who fear you turn to me that they may know your testimonies. And not only did the psalmist know God's word, he desired a greater dependence and obedience to God. Verse 80, may my heart be blameless in your statutes that I, that I may not be put to shame. Well, this brings us back to the question of the day. What is a need? Well, friends, it seems conclusive that if this question was posed to the author of our text, his answer would be, I need God. Now, can you see it? Or maybe you can't see it. Then I don't know what anybody could say to you or to convince you other than prayerfully, maybe you should read Psalm 119 in all its entirety, entirety and the Lord would give you what the psalmist understood, that you need God. Here's another question for you. Is God your creator? I hope you've answered yes. If yes, does God know you? If God, as King David said, uh, your eyes saw my unformed substance and your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them, Psalm 139, 16. Does God know you? Does God know your circumstances today? Does he know your future? Does he know you? Let me go back to the first question. What is a need? How would you define it? Would you define it as you need a new job, a career, or maybe some better health or more money? Well, Abigail Dawes came to the conclusion that God's ideas of about, about our thriving and flourishing are different than ours. When we think of thriving, doing well in our lives, we often think of a good job or good relationships with our family and friends, a loving spouse and happy kids. These are good things. Yet for all that Abigail went through with her family, she came to realize that, quote, in God's economy we flourish when our need for him is met in him. The Apostle Paul understood this truth all too well as he encouraged the Philippian church in his letter to them when he said, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am content. I know how to be brought low and how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. So what was Paul's secret? Well, was the very next statement he said, I can do all things through him who strengthens, strengthens me. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. See, Abigail Dodds came to the same conclusion as the Apostle Paul when she said, quote, Dear brothers and sisters, there's no circumstance under heaven that God isn't using to grow us into oaks of righteousness. There's no need he won't fill himself. The promise is really true. God really will supply all our needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, verse 19. There's nothing we truly need that is not found in Christ, end quote. What is a need? What is your need today? What do we need today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day? The Apostle Paul and Abigail, Abigail came to understand they needed God every day. My prayer for each of us is that we would join Paul and Abigail and know what Elizabeth Elliot experienced in her life. God has promised to supply all our needs what we don't have now, we don't need now. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you. Thank you that you are merciful and gracious and loving, and just and holy. And then we, in our day-to-day -day struggle, when we come up confused and wonder what it's all about, we can turn to your word and trust your word to teach us and guide us in the way that we should go. It is indeed a light unto our path. And I pray for every person listening and watching, Lord, that you would bless them with this knowledge deep into their hearts. And Lord, we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Take care, folks.
Shalom.